Welcome to our worship service for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. We are grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples and to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 To his best Isaiah. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him, and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The Word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Many years ago, I believe I was still an undergraduate at the time at Chapel Hill, uh, although I may be wrong about that, but I do remember visiting my rector, Peter Lee, who later became my bishop in Virginia. I remember visiting Peter in his office about something that was bothering my tender conscience. Blessedly, I no longer remember what it was. What I do remember is how our meeting ended. Uh, Peter said, Geoffrey, I forgive you. In the name of God and in the name of the church, I forgive you. Why don't we pray? And I remember the extraordinary release I felt from whatever was bothering me. Bothering me. It was as though a weight had been lifting off my shoulders, as though I'd somehow been cleansed, but, but it's like I'd been unbound, I'd been freed in some important way. Now, hold that thought while we turn to considering Peter's confession of faith at Caesarea Philippi. In Matthew's story, the disciples are in Caesarea Philippi with Jesus when he asks them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? As is often the case in scripture, the place matters. Caesarea Philippi, about 35 miles from Jerusalem, was a rural place called Panias, originally originally dedicated to the Greek god Pan, known for, known for his uh, association with countryside and with celebrations and so on. He was depicted as a human with a, a goat's hindquarters, rather like a fawn or a satyr. But around the time of Jesus' birth, Philip the Tetrarch founded a city there, which became known for a while as Caesarea Philippi, for most of Jesus' life, actually. It is now Uh, an archaeological site in the Golan Heights called Banias. But for 15 or 20 years, Caesarea Philippi was the administrative center of a large region that included Jerusalem, and so also the local headquarters of the Roman army. So when Jesus asks his disciples just back from their mission, who do people say that the Son of Man is? He's asking in the midst of every symbol of imperial Rome. In light of answers like John the Baptist, in light of this, answers like John the Baptist or one of the prophets are relatively safe. That's not uh, treasonous. It's Simon, son of Jonah, who thinks the unthinkable and speaks the unspeakable when he names Jesus by a title fully in opposition to imperial authority and imperial claims. You are the Messiah the Christ, the Son of the living God. Theologians and historians, Bible scholars have all spent time unpacking the meanings of the various titles by which Jesus is known and it's fascinating stuff. But for now, I'd like to focus on what Jesus has to say about the implications of Peter's confession of faith. Jesus makes clear that there are profound implications of the confession but also that it's gonna take time for those implications to become obvious when he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. First, 
Think about it. First, he renames Simon as Peter, a play on words, and says, on this rock, Greek Petra, on this rock, I will build my church. And then this extraordinary promise, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Most commentators understand this to mean first, that the foundation of the church is not Peter himself, but the content of his confession. The foundation of the church is Jesus being recognized as Messiah, as savior, as Christ. And second, that Peter is given authority in earth to say what is allowed, what is okay, and what is not allowed, what is not okay. But I hear more than that in what Jesus said. It's not about permission exactly. When I think of what it means to bind and to loose, I first think about the, word, the Latin word religio, related to words like ligament and ligature and so on, and often translated as I bind. In religion, we are bound in some way and in some positive sense. I believe we're bound together bound to God in Christ, not left alone, not left to our own devices. But there's a darker side to this binding. It's to do with human power, of course, the side that leads so many to declare themselves spiritual, but not religious. The dark side of binding is seen in everything from the Spanish Inquisition to the torture of alleged heretics to the ways in which religion has been used to affirm things like slavery, and capital punishment and even war, all ways in which people find themselves bound in oppressive ways, bound like, as it were, by sin, bound by the powers of the institutions and societies in which they find themselves, and particularly bound by the power of the church. When I think of loosing, I remember what it was like to hear Peter Lee declare my forgiveness. I think about uh, how Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes of his birth, in a sense, sh shed them in the, with the shroud when, in his resurrection. I think of how when Lazarus came out of the grave, Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. I think of loosing as, or being unbound, as the sheer joy of someone who has been living on the streets or in a shelter, finally receiving a coveted housing voucher. It's an extraordinary extraordinary moment of celebration. I think of the sense of freedom that some addicts feel when they begin to know they have claimed life and put their addiction behind them. But of course there is the dark side of this loosing as well. When we leave people to their own devices on the basis of some gospel of individualism, we frequently have the effect, intended or not, of condemning them not to being freed, but to being cut off from what they might need for life in society. We now see that the dismantling of much of our former welfare system has put great burdens both on the needy, on the mentally ill, and significantly also on the police. Brothers and sisters, the authority to bind and to loose can be narrowly construed as about Peter and his successor saying what's okay and what's not okay, and arguments about whether they're infallible in any sense. But it seems to me that it's more power given to the whole church, which includes you and me. How do we keep ourselves bound in ways that are life-giving? I'm thinking of things like investing in our community of faith. I'm thinking of things like the spiritual practices to which we pay attention of worship and service and generosity. And how do we keep ourselves bound in ways that are destructive? Maybe this has to do with unhelpful habits or refusing to open our eyes to new possibilities or new situations, choosing to stay with the comfort of blindness to which we've become accustomed rather than to risking new possibilities in seeing through the eyes of another. I th I'm amazed that there are some people so concerned about the end, the, the diversity in society and the end of white male hegemony, that they're intellectually arguing 
that white privilege and institutional racism do not exist. Open your eyes. It's so once you start to see, you cannot not see, you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. I recently heard someone confess that he tended to judge people negatively who did not vote. If you don't vote, you get what you deserve. But as he began to learn about the history of voter suppression, conscious and unconscious, but mostly conscious in this country, the long history done by Democrats and Republicans, as he began to learn about that history, he began to get some understanding of how voting for some communities just seems like a waste of time, it seems an irrelevance. And he began to open his eyes to new possibilities uh, out of this long and shameful history. Now my hope for you and my hope for me in these strange days of economic decline and unemployment, of racial unsettlement and protest, and of course the pandemic and how to manage it. In these strange days, my hope is that we continue to proclaim them Jesus as Messiah and continue to find ways to make the good news incarnate both in our own lives and in the world about us. Perhaps the image of binding and loosing, both in its powerful, gospel, liberating sense and fully cognizant of the fact that human power can lead binding and loosing to take very dark sides. But if we remember the power at the image of binding and loosing, the real power given us as the church, it can both be a lens, perhaps both can be a lens that shape our behaviour in ways pleasing to God. I offer these thoughts in the hope that you will live abundantly and claim the promises of the gospel and make them manifest in your life. I offer this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, source of life, wellspring of health and wholeness, whose love and grace rain down on all creatures, we cry out to you. Holy God, hear our prayers in these days of protest, poverty, and pandemic. We ask your blessing on government leaders and all in possessions of influence that they may work to reduce the suffering in our communities our nation and the world. We pray for doctors, nurses, paramedics, medical technicians, community health workers, social workers, therapists, pharmacists, and all who provide medical care, that you will protect and sustain them. We remember before you, O oh God, the research and science communities who work to hasten the development of vaccines and for, for relief from our miseries, and ask that you bless them in their labors. Amen. Protect and strengthen, we pray, those essential workers who work to sustain us, keep us connected, and maintain our basic necessities. O oh God, we ask that you sustain and encourage hospital, nursing, hospice, palliative care center, and home care staff housekeepers, and all who have close contact with the vulnerable. We remember before you educators and teachers, students, and parents of students, especially as teachers and some learners return to school. We pray for those who continue to remote learning and for those who have no resources for remote learning. We ask guidance for our youth as they seek to understand these woefully uncertain times. Amen. We ask safety and sustenance for transportation crews, <laughs> truck drivers, taxi drivers, and all who transport people, food, and essential goods. We ask blessing and safety for those returning to work as restaurant workers, cooks, chefs, dishwashers, and for caterers, farmers, and food growers, and manufacturers as they meet our basic needs and offer us the joy of sustaining food. Watch over all florists, 
artists, musicians, actors, singers, writers, poets, especially those unable to work, and all who fill our lives with beauty and art that remind us of the wonder of your creation. Amen. We pray for those who are unemployed or underemployed, unable to feed their families, in fear for their lives, and living with economic hardship or disaster, asking that you guide us to find ways to offer sustenance in their time of need. Oh God, we beg protection for those who are poor and vulnerable, for migrants, prisoners, and refugees, and for those who are isolated in any way. We pray for all who are affected by gender or race-based violence, for those who live in, with emotional or physical abuse, for those who are bullied. We pray for those who work for personal and societal transformation, that they may be comforted in their distress and sustained in their work. Amen. We ask your blessing on the work of St. Albans regathering task groups, that they may find ways to worship together swiftly and safely. Keep us mindful of what we bind on earth and what we loose on earth, that we may in all things work for our common good and claim the promises of abundant life in your gospel. We ask your healing grace for all who are sick, remembering especially Arturo Manzo, Beatrice Montgomery, Virginia Foster, Eric Bradley, Matilda Beal, Armando Panetta, Penny Glass, Robin Huddleston, Steve Bergen, Maywin Hoagland, Bruce Barrow, and Linda Chandler. May they receive your healing grace at work in body, mind, and spirit. Amen. O oh God, we beg your compassionate grace for all who cannot be physically present with their loved ones to show final touches, excuse me, to share final touches, words, and memories, and for those who cannot grieve together during these last times. Merciful God, we ask you to grant the faithfully departed eternal life and peace, especially remembering Anita Ruth Nelson, Louisa Jors, Tom Van Allen, Robert Trump, and Stephen F. Williams. Sustain and comfort those who grieve. Breathe your spirit of loving compassion and tender care on them today and always. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised to hear the prayers of those who ask in your son's name, we beseech you to mercifully hear us who have now made our prayers to you and grant that those things which we have asked faithfully according to your will may be granted to the relief of our great need and to the setting forth of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Praying in the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done. done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful Lord, we, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen.
May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, also with you. you. Again, thank you for joining us in our worship today. We are so grateful for your continued generosity to the parish. Uh, the news is good, as Jeffrey likes to say. The building is closed, but the church is open, and we are doing Christ's work in the world because of your generosity. If you're watching this service online and are new to us on the YouTube video, there is an online welcome card. If you're liking what you're seeing, if you're feeling called by God in any way, if you're being inspired in any way, be in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you and join you on your journey in faith. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and remain with us forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.